Life's a coat of many colors. It is never black and white. Can't have one without the other. The dark without the light. In the summer, we were lovers. With the flame, our hearts would burn. A flame, the autumn would smother and leave this heart to yearn forever blue. No one will ever know that without you, I'm forever blue. No What's up, ladies and gentlemen of the Dark Waters family? It's your boy Dark Waters back, and I got my guidelines. And we get ready to get into Moth Man. We about to go in. We're gonna do some chitter chatting about what I find to be one of the most mysterious cryptids out there. Because it seems as if Mothman just pops up out of nowhere. And I'm really interested in hearing about the activity that's going on in Chicago. Lon just recently wrote a, wrote a book on it. And I'm excited to speak with Lon. Now, for those of you guys who don't know, Lon has been one of the very early supporters of the Dark Waters channel and the Dark Waters family. I mean, from the very, very beginning, Lon has been around supporting us and, uh, and posting some of the videos and helping us out. Before I bring Lon in, let me say thank you to my moderators, everybody in the chat. And again, if you are typically have been a moderator and you see that you don't have your wrench right now, you will get your wrench back tomorrow. So don't worry about it. And uh, it's all good. It's all good. With that being said, let's get it started. Lon, how's it going tonight, my friend? Hey, DW, I'm doing fine, man. First of all, thank you for joining me. I appreciate you. No problem. You know that. Um, and I appreciate your support and your love that you've given me. And guys, just to just to kind of tell you a little about a bit about how Lon and I hooked up. When I was first getting started in doing my interviews, I was scheduled to do an interview with Lon. And he got all this hate mail calling me a fraud and uh, all the rest of this stuff. And Lon, being the man that he is, reached out and was like, look, I need to talk to this guy. We ended up talking, and that, that's what you're supposed to do. And we hit it off. And Lon and I have worked on a couple of little things together on monetization of some stories. And, and he's definitely about to be a part of this major move that I'm in the process of doing. So Lon has been there from the beginning, and he's been very supportive. So Dark Waters family, make sure you support him at Phantoms and Monsters blog. And if you got a little extra money from your paycheck, go on over and buy one of the books. Uh, I had an opportunity to get the book and take a look at it and read a little bit of it. And it's, it's a wonderful book. So with that being said, Lon, let's start talking about Mothman. Mothman, my earliest kind of reading about Mothman was about this encounter on uh, the bridge. Remember that there's the bridge encounter where the bridge collapsed after people actually saw Mothman. And he was supposed to be, it's my understanding, he's supposed to be a harbinger of um, great change or at a disaster, both, both of those things. Could you start with uh, giving us, filling us in on what exactly is the myth behind Mothman, as much as you can, please? Well, <laughs> it, yeah, th this goes back to the uh, sightings back in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, back in 66 and 67. Uh, what happened was um, for about a year period before the silver bridge collapse, people had been reporting seeing this, uh, this winged humanoid that they said looked like a, a humanoid, a human with moth wings and very bright, large, uh, red eyes. And, um, it had, there have been several people who had encounters with this thing. And, and most of it was taking place at the West Virginia ordinance works which a lot of people dub as the TNT plant, but um, the the younger people go out there with the drive out there 
and uh, they would encounter this thing. So it got to be big news, eventually spread out. Um, others got involved with, with the investigation. John Keel, of course, documented it in the Mothman prophecies. But there's a lot of other stuff going on, too. There were UFO activity, men in black and such. But anyway, the Silver Bridge, uh, just before Christmas in 67, the bridge collapsed. And 46 people lost their lives. So, you know, because this being a small town and it's such a major disaster in a small area, I actually believe the... Uh, the harbinger of doom tag was put on the Mothman. Basically, people saying that he uh, foretold the uh, the bridge collapse, which honestly I don't really buy into. You know, there have been so supposed uh, examples of this happening before. Though the uh, the black the Blackbird of Chernobyl was one instance where. There were some sightings of a winged being above the uh, nuclear plant before the, the, the meltdown. But there have been other supposed reports of other disasters and the uh, people seeing these winged humanoids as well. But personally, I, I really don't put much stock into it. And I can understand that. Um, but as human beings, you know what we do. We try and find some kind of explanation for what's going on so at the end of yeah. the day they probably blamed it on mothman because it's hard to digest the fact that um that all those people died so you got to find some kind of reason something to blame it on mm. so mothman probably yeah didn't. i think that's what happened and you know it, it was such a small town and you know something like that going on you know people you're right people look for an excuse and uh they try to come up with something to explain why that would actually happen though you know i have talked to several people who've had premon who had premonitions of that bridge collapse before it actually happened so um you know i can only go by what they're telling me but i think there's something to it no absolutely i'm pretty sure there is something to it um now before we start talking about the actual book, walk us through your process of when you're dealing with an eyewitness. And I think that's important to start there because when people try and discredit uh, eyewitnesses' stories, um, the process of gathering information from an eyewitness is very important. And I want you to lay that out for us, and then we'll go into some of the things that are going on in Chicago. By the way, I personally believe that Mothman is around Chicago because of all the death and violence that goes on in Chicago. But um, walk us through the process of you dealing with your eyewitnesses and how you gather your information, please. Well, it depends on the, yeah, it depends on the eyewitness. Uh, but overall, I would say, say somebody, somebody writes, uh, writes an email to me and, uh, you know, I respond to them. So I, you know, I, I will not in in this case with this flap in Chicago, unless I talk to the witness, uh, I wasn't going to put a whole lot of stock into it. So, you know, I'd get the report, check out the location of the report, uh, talk to the team. Cause we got a task force and, um, uh, if they, you know, if they were able to talk to the person in person, you know, personally, that would, that would be great. But most of the times it was me calling them up and talking to them. Now, what I would do, and this is one thing that was quite unusual about these particular reports, the witnesses for the most part, and I'd say 95% of the reports the witnesses stuck to the original description. And that's kind of unusual. Um, I mean, it got to the point where I'd get the report, I'd talk to the individual, the eyewitness, and try to get them to embellish on it to see if, you know, if they actually saw something. Uh, and 
they wouldn't do it. I'm telling you. And it was it was really surprising. And in fact, Manuel Navarrete, he was taking reports as well. He commented to me about it. He said, you know, these people won't embellish on their stories. I mean, they're sticking to what they're seeing and the original, you know, the original description. And like I said, in, in these type of, you know, cryptic reports, paranormal reports, that's pretty unusual. So, you know, of course, we got a few cranks and um, some reports I couldn't verify or justify. And I would eventually just take them off. But um, I, I, I do believe the reports that I actually put into the book and what I have on the map now are, uh, are verifiable. And in fact, I, uh, I had one of the members of the group go back and verify the sighting with the witness. So we're, they're all verified. Awesome. Amazing. And I know exactly what you're talking about when you say trying to get someone to embellish their story. It's a tried and proven way to kind of get the truth out of a person. Just start adding stuff to their story and see mm -hmm. what they do. If they agree with you, if they don't agree with you. So that's awesome. That's amazing. Now, one of the things that I, uh, when I was on the website and I was looking at Mothman stories, I, I was reading one about a couple in Chicago that were walking down the street and Mothman actually flew above them and hovered, flapping his wings. And then I think the followed them back to their apartment. Let's get into some of the um, encounters that people have had in Chicago. Are you seeing where there's any kind of commonality between the eyewitnesses? Is it a certain race of people, um, a certain particular geographical area where people are seeing Mothman, or is it just spread across the board? It's been pretty well. It's been pretty spread out. I mean, uh, we had areas where there were pockets of sightings, uh, in particular on the uh, on the river. I mean, on the lakefront area, which is a large area, uh, in Little Village, which that neighborhood has seven sightings, the Forest Park Oak Park neighborhood, uh, McCook, which is an industrial area. And some parts of northeast, excuse me, northwest Indiana. Those those were the pockets, basically. But I tell you, the witnesses themselves ran the gamut of, you know, race, economic status, and such. So there was no commonality, and that's one of the first things we started looking at. If there was a commonality with these uh, with these eyewitnesses, so uh, no, it was it was pretty evened out. No, that's amazing. Now, and you know what? I'm remiss with something because I, I didn't start with this. And one of the, the people in the chat room wants you to give a basic description of Mothman. Could you give them a basic description um, based on all the evidence that you've gathered? And then we'll go into the next question. Well, the, uh, the Mothman, you know, that is typical of what people saw in Point Pleasant isn't typical of what was going on in Chicago. Though one of the, or two of the sightings were somewhat similar, and uh, that would be the Oz Park sighting where the uh, where the witness described having the wings like the uh, the moth wings and such, but the wings in that particular sighting seemed to be a bit larger than what it was described in, in West Virginia. The uh, there were a lot of sightings with the, the large red glowing eyes uh the way it would propel itself without flapping the wings just shooting from the, the the ground upwards and then a lot of times it would screech as it took off but the descriptions throughout the chicago sightings went from the uh the mothman typical mothman then to an owl man where some of the uh, Hispanic uh, witnesses were calling it La Cusa, which is a, uh, a legendary winged being from the Rio Grande area. But after the first three or four sightings, the rest of the sightings were described as having a wing like a bat or a gargoyle. And the size range 
anywhere from five to six foot in height, the body, which was thin, dark in color, and a wingspan anywhere from 10 to 12 foot. Man, that's big. Some some had the red eyes, some didn't. Has anybody kind of delved into what the red eyes are about? Do we have any idea why the eyes are glowing red, what that's about? That's, you know, that's been a mystery ever since Point Pleasant. I mean, I have no idea why that goes on. Um, you know, like I said, not all the witnesses saw it. Now, the, the one interesting aspect to this that I thought was interesting were the witnesses that you referenced on the lakefront, the couple. And um, when this being uh, descended and hovered in front of them, they said the eyes were, uh, you know, kind of going in and out like, uh, I don't know, not necessarily blinking, but they were going from very light to dimming and back and forth. So uh, that was something that wasn't described in any other sightings. Uh, I guess maybe because it was in that certain position where it was hovering in front of them. And when I say a hovering, I mean this thing had its wings spread out and was like a few feet above the pavement. Uh, this particular instance, they said the uh, the bee had it was had a narrow it had a uh, thin body, but the legs and the feet were evident, but it was vibrating, and they could feel the vibration. And the wings were leathery like like a bat, but and they could see the light from behind it coming through the bat wing membrane. When you uh, say vibration, when you say vibrating, they mean vibrating from the wings flapping or vibrating as in the, the legs, itself the legs vibrating. vibrating. Yeah, the feet and legs were vibrating. Um, which, you know, that that was that was very unusual. And uh, the uh the body itself was black in color, but th the woman described it as being like a black shell or that it was moist because it was shiny in some parts of it. So, um, yeah, that was, that was probably the most, uh, accurate or, you know, the, the, the best description we got of this being. All right. So now let's get into some of the stuff that I know everybody wants to know. Did you have any encounters where somebody tried to shoot at it or tried to accost the creature or where it actually attacked anyone, like physically attacked them? No. And th that didn't happen. You know, it was um, it was kind of aggressive in a couple instances where it chased down uh, the witness that they ran away and would uh, would come down and, and land in front of it but there were no real attacks. Now, the last sighting in uh, Piotrowski Park in a little village, the couple were in a car and this thing landed on the hood of the car and the witnesses stated that it was attempting to get at them through the windshield. Oh but, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know how true that is. I, I'm just going by what they told us. There was no actual contact with the witnesses, though. Man, that's that's scary. I mean, that that would be scary. So they're just driving down the street, or they're parked in the side of the car. They were parked. Out, hugging. Yeah, they, they were parked. parked. Yeah. So they had parked. He's trying to get his touchy feely on with his girl, and this thing lands on the hood. I, I would mm -hmm. freak out, bro. I would completely lose my stuff and <laughs> freak out over that one. Um, now. I wanted to ask you something about those neighborhoods. So those neighborhoods are, are these like the higher end um, property neighborhoods or this, is this the lower end property neighborhoods? It's middle class poverty stricken areas. What, what about these neighborhoods that these sightings are happening in? What is the, well, on the lake, the, yeah, the lake front were kind of high end. There were condominiums for the most part. There were some uh, high end homes and like the Lincoln park area. Uh, some of the sightings were in South Chicago where they were just maybe lower income neighborhoods, but there were also middle-class neighborhoods as well. Upper middle-class neighborhoods, Forest Park, Oak Park, Melrose Park. Um, 
than industrial neighborhoods where there were a, a lot of industry, but there were some, you know, some uh, residents there. And of course, there were some, uh, er, I mean, uh, suburban areas as well. So I'm telling you, it was nothing that you really distinguishable while where it showed up. I mean, it even showed up in Lincoln Park Zoo in one instance. So, uh, yeah, it was going everywhere. I mean, it, it wasn't anything to find. Yeah, and the reason why I ask that question is because I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to logically kind of figure out what it's doing there. You know, like, why are you there? And you, it's, you're popping up everywhere. You're showing yourself everywhere. How long has this been going on? Well, there were three sightings back in 2011. But uh, before the 2017 sightings, uh, there had been scattered sightings. And some of the earlier sightings go back back to the mid nineties, um, just scattered sightings. But the first sighting in 2017 was actually in March. Now the first reported sighting to us was in April. So uh, altogether we had uh, 53, what we've called verified sightings in 2017 and the last was in october 7 october 27th but it's picked up again and we had a sighting in uh, early february in uh in forest park oak park and uh we've had several sightings south of the city south west of the city and we're getting sightings up in to wisconsin now you know that is insane because at, at that i'm glad you expounded on that because for one second i was thinking you know i'm thinking some jeepers creepers type thing where it comes every 10 years and maybe does something now have you guys taken the time to actually investigate and see if there's been an increase in missing persons in the area or if the crime has it increased I'm trying to figure out what kind of effect it has had on the area. Um, maybe in those specific areas, there was increase in crime, increase in missing persons. Have you seen anything like that? Any correlation to that? We haven't seen any uh, missing pet reports of that, you know, that, or, you know, there was, a, you know, reports of an increase of missing pets. Um the crime actually has gone down a little bit in Chicago overall since the mid 2016, from what I've been told. Now, I don't know if it has, that has anything to do with it, but um, you know, we we've tried to figure out, <laughs> looked at all angles as far as uh, anything going on in the city that comparably, you know, be part of what's why these things are being seen. You know, I we've got a few working theories, uh, possible summoning or a possibility of these coming through some type of interdimensional portal or alternate reality. We also had a, we even had a witch come forward and say that she may actually have conjured this thing up by accident. So, you know, and, you know, it's hard. It's almost very difficult to prove that. But, you know, we made light of the report and uh one of my investigators talked to her so um you know we're we're looking at all angles we're keeping our our minds open for everything at this point yeah that's 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 crazy that's absolutely insane so now news reports is this hitting the local news um they just like yeah we saw there was another there were some uh movie. there were some reports in the local news uh there was one report in the Tribune, but the local papers, the, the neighborhood papers, uh, covered it for, for a degree. I mean, the Chicago Reader actually, which is a, you know, a neighborhood, you know, a neighborhood paper, local paper that they did about five or six stories related to that. There, <laughs> there was a rap artist who did a song about it. And, uh, there were, uh, but Vice.com did a, did a story on it. They contacted one of the witnesses and talked to them. 
And some of the witnesses did eventually come forward and talk to people that I recommended they talk to. So, you know, you know, it has been reported to a degree. I was on several of the radio stations in Chicago. But as far as uh, it getting out beyond Chicago, I mean, it got on the Internet. But as far as getting in the press and media, not that much. So. Okay. I tell you what, Lon, let's take a quick break because I drank a little bit too much water. Hold on one second. I'm going to play okay. a story to entertain everybody. I'll be right back. Life's a coat of many colors. It is never black and white. Can't have one without the other. The dark without the light. In the summer, we were lovers. With the flame, our hearts would burn. A flame, the autumn would smother and leave this heart to yearn forever blue. No, I will heaven know that without you, I'm forever blue. What's up, ladies and gentlemen of the Dark Waters family? It's your boy, Dark Waters, back. And I got my guidelines. And we get ready to get into Moth, man. We about to go in. We're going to do we some chitter-chatting about what I find to be one of the most mysterious cryptids out there. Because it seems as if Mothman just pops up out of nowhere. And I'm really interested in hearing about the activity that's going on in Chicago. Lon just recently wrote a, wrote a book on it. And I'm excited to speak with Lon. Now, for those of you guys who don't know, Lon has been one of the very early supporters of the Dark Waters channel and adult waters family i mean from the very very beginning line has been around supporting us and uh and posting some of the videos and helping us out before i bring line in let me say thank you to my moderators everybody in the chat and again if you are typically have been a moderator and you see that you don't have your wrench right now you will get your wrench back tomorrow so don't worry about it and uh it's all good it's all good with that being said let's get it started line how's it going tonight my friend Hey, DW, I'm doing fine, man. First of all, thank you for joining me. I appreciate you. No problem. You know that. Um, and I appreciate your support and your love that you've given me. And guys, just to just to kind of tell you a little about a bit about how Lon and I hooked up. When I was first getting started in doing my interviews, I was scheduled to do when I turned the corner on St. Peter's headed to Decatur, I saw someone out of the corner of my eye. It looked like a man walking behind me. I was 20 feet back. I could see a silhouette and a pronounced hat on his head. Man, I wasn't in the right mind and I was sick with worry. I remember thinking to myself, I wish this walker behind me would play games. I'm going to beat his ass. I had walked halfway down St. Peter's. On my left side was Jackson Square, and on the right side were these shops and restaurants that were all closed. And this area was dark, not pitch black, but city dark. The bright lights were ahead of me and behind me. And for some reason, I looked in the window of one of those closed shops, and in the reflection of the window, I thought I saw someone walking right behind me. My reaction? I turned around swinging, throwing a right hook that would have knocked Mike Tyson out. But I hit nothing but air. Then my body got to chills as my eyes locked on this figure, a shadow standing right next to the light pole in a bench. Now, the best way to explain this is the little light pole was shining directly on this thing. He was standing there with his arms folded in this casual posture that reminded me of someone waiting on a bus or something. It wasn't super tall, no more than 5'10 or 5'11. And at first, I thought it was a street performer. But it was way too early in the morning for those guys to be out. So I started walking backwards towards the Cater Street, keeping my eye on this thing. I must have walked about 20 or 30 paces backwards 
when I heard people talking behind me. I looked away for a split second, and when I turned back, it was gone. The best way to describe the emotions I was feeling at that time is this. If you ever stepped into a cold shower, you know what that does to your brain. It resets it. I was completely freaking out. And at this point in time, all I wanted to do was get to the cafe. So I walked as fast as I could for that last block across the street. And there she was, sitting with some old lady giggling and laughing. Beignet powder all over her face. And I wanted to be mad at her, but my emotions were all over the place. So I sat down and asked her, girl, why are you out here so late? To which she replied, baby, it's early in New Orleans. I've been doing this since I was in high school. Now eat some sugar, you big dummy. I really, really wanted to tell her what I saw. But instead, I tried to forget it and block it out. It wasn't until I heard Dark Waters on WWL radio telling a story about a shadow man in the cigar shop that I remembered this encounter. And with that being said, I know for a fact that Hat Man is real. My encounter wasn't super scary and it wasn't in my bedroom, but I know what I saw. And I don't want to see his ever again. All right, guys, I'm back, and I took care of business. Lon, you there? I hear you. I hear you coming in. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have questions for Lon, type them in the chat, put them in caps, and I will work those questions into the conversation. I will seamlessly weave your question into this conversation. Lon, you back? Yes, I am. So we were talking about Chicago, and we were talking about the area <clears> that Hall <throat> Fan was, was in. And one of the questions that comes to the chat is, um, and you kind of touched on this, but if you had to give us your best guess, what do you personally think Mothman is? Well, um, I, I think overall, and I, I've thought this for a while now, even before this started in Chicago, I, I've always thought that this is um, is a being from an, an alternate reality. And I don't think it's an indigenous being. I think it's something that's from somewhere else. I'm not maybe a parallel world, uh, another dimension of some type. I don't know, but I don't think it's from here. I don't think it's from here either. I, I, I don't think it's from here at all. It makes no sense. And I don't think it's a, a chimera or a chimera or anything like that, like some genetically spliced creature. I think it's from like another world or another dimension. And we know for a fact that there's been research into how people can open portals to other dimensions. Um, that goes into CERN and to the the work that they're doing with CERN. So I think it, I think it's coming from somewhere else now. Well, right. you know, Chicago has a, um, they have a, a particle accelerator in Chicago. It's actually been there for over 40 years at the Fermi labs. Now, they they state that this thing's been shut down for about seven years now, I think. But I don't know. There's there's still a lot of activity that goes on around there. And uh, there, there I, I have actually read a lot of material uh, that does state that quantum computing with the use of uh, particle acceleration has may have the ability to open up portals. Now, I don't know how factual that is. I don't know if it's even real, but uh, you know, it's something just to consider it. And uh, you know, with, with what happened in, in uh, Point Pleasant, you know, I, I think that was uh, sp more spiritual than anything else. I think it was summoned by uh, by a strong spirit, possibly native indigenous spirit that summon this thing as a guardian or something to um, be a sentry of some type. So, uh, you know, and I, and I felt that for a long time now. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't know that they had a, a, a particle collider in Chicago. And, and you would, we wouldn't really know if it's still active, to be complete and totally honest with you. What do you think about the government's uh, knowledge of this? Have you seen any signs where clearly our government is aware of this activity? Has that come to your, um, you know, like the Ben in Black visiting anybody after they had their encounter or anything like that? Well, nothing like that. But um, the city of Chicago is well aware of what's been going on. Um, 
you know, we had one, I think, well, we had a couple sightings by police officers, but the one sighting in particular was the police officer swears he wrote a report. And, uh, and that sighting was verified by another witness. So when we sent out Freedom of Information to Act request to the police department, oh in fact, we, we, we sent four of them out. And they were all sent back or uh, received an answer within two days, which is unheard of. So they were flagging. They were they they knew when this was coming in, they were going to give. They had a standard answer, which was the only answer they gave was, "We had no document, no report of this." Uh, we talked to somebody in City Hall, who actually was one of the witnesses. She had a political job in City Hall. She said the city is very aware of what's been going on, that there may have been some concerns uh, about the tourism problems that may cause in the city of Chicago. Most of these sites were going on during the summer. And uh, I also talked to a couple of police officers who told me that people were aware of it in the police department as well. So, yeah, I mean, the local government knew about it. As far as the feds, I have no idea. Now, that's one thing <clears throat> that I can attest to. Here we have a lot of activity that I know for a fact our government knows about. I mean, our, our local government knows about. I've spoken to our police, one of our police chiefs um, about it. He's since retired. Um, and they know about a lot of crazy stuff that goes on and they do everything they can to protect the tourism industry. Because if people knew that you were walking amongst the, in the French quarters, drunk, walking amongst creatures and things that are otherworldly, they would not come to new Orleans and hang out if they knew what was really going on. So I can, mm -hmm. I can definitely see that. I can definitely see that. Um, or another question from the chat is. You know, are there any other cities other than Chicago that people are seeing these things at this point in time, or is all the activity centered around Chicago? Other than the Point Pleasant sightings, this is the only flap or group of sightings that I know of in an urban area. Now, there have been sightings, in fact, we're, we're working on a group of sightings down in Pasco County, Florida. We've had three sightings near Zephyr Hills, Florida. But uh, historically, I know of no other, even cryptids, I'm just not talking about flying humanoids, but cryptids in general in, in an urban setting, let alone a city the size of Chicago. Hmm. That is interesting. That's, that's actually kind of frightening to me. It really, really is. I have family in, in Chicago. My, you know, my family is originally from Mississippi, and we have spread out all over the place. And I'm going to reach out to some of my little ignorant cousins. A lot of those guys are gangsters, but I'm going to reach out to a couple of them and see if they have heard anything about Mothman. And knowing them, if they have, they're so animated, they'll probably call in and want to share their story <laughs> because those guys are off the chain, man. When I say my family is crazy, dude, my family is bananas crazy. Um, next question. People are wondering, could it be a gargoyle um, and, you know, a statue that actually turns into a, an entity or a being? What's your thoughts on that? Well, we've heard about shape-shifting in a couple of these. Uh, well, one in particular, which was um, back in December of 2016. Uh, but I think that was an isolated instance I and mean, i don't even know how much relationship it has to these other sightings but we have had people that have um described as being as looking like a gargoyle uh one description that has come up several times is it looks like the creeper from jeepers creepers uh really oh yeah oh yeah and you know what i've been getting that for years it's not just what's been going on in Chicago. That creeper uh, description has been used for a lot of these flying humanoid sightings. That's scary, man. In a lot That's of really different scary. places. 
Because you know art imitates life. So when people see these movies, there's some truth in, in each one of these movies that they put out. Like, so Jeepers Creepers 1, 2, and 3, it's got to be based in some form of truth somewhere. You know what I'm saying? They get it from somewhere. That's the scary thing about it, man. And uh, But you haven't been able to correlate any missing people to it, so it doesn't it doesn't seem like it falls in that um, in that same vein as what the Jeepers Creepers thing was. You know what I'm saying? So I don't know, but that's yeah. Well, scary, I though. looked I looked into that, and uh, you know, the first Jeepers Creepers movie was in 2001, and I I actually looked into the uh, the nexus of the uh, the story, but it's just a fictional story, uh, and it doesn't seem to be based on anything in particular. Okay, but uh, the, the description itself is pretty similar to what people have been seeing, according to them, anyway. Yeah, and and it could be the other way around. It could be life imitating art too. You know how it goes. Mm-hmm. So it, it could be that. It could be that. Tell me a little bit about the team. That's is this Butch that's going out and doing these investigations. Tell me a little bit about the team that's going out and checking on these things. Well, we have a team in Chicago now. Butch and, and myself do a lot of the investigations here in Pennsylvania. Um, but he's, he's part of the team cause we do a lot of advisory work together, uh, and also field work, but the team in Chicago consists of first of, uh, of Manuel Navarrete, who's with UFO clearing house. He actually received some of the first reports, noticed the reports on MUFON, alerted me to him and we started checking them out together as we went on, uh, the team's we picked up other members as well, people interested or investigators, uh, Vance Nesbitt, Nicole Krajic, uh, Tobias Whalen, his wife Emily, uh, Rosemary Allen Gotti is part of the team. And uh, we've got some other individuals outside of Chicago who are also involved. So, you know, it, it, it's one of these things that where we get sightings and we get reports. We do have people in Chicago area that are looking into it, but we've also got a lot of advisors as well. And uh, we we have a chat thread that we get on and kind of throw things up against the wall and see what sticks and gets everybody's opinion of what's going on. And that worked pretty well. And in fact, in the book, I got summations from all the members of the group and they all added what they thought this thing may be. So, you know, I'm, I've been open to a lot of different, um, you know, I've been open to everything. We've all been open to it. You know, we've considered a lot of different scenarios. That's good. That's interesting. Let me ask you, this is a great question that came in. What about any physical evidence? So, like, has Mothman left any hair follicles, anything like that, that um, like when it landed on a car, did it was there any saliva gathered, anything like that? Have you have you heard any physical evidence being gathered? Unfortunately, we haven't been able to get any of that stuff. You know, we we just have not been able to get it. I, I guess if uh, some of these witnesses would have had the peace of mind to collect something like this, I guess they probably would have tried. But you know, we couldn't even get a photograph, let alone evidence. So I, I you know, even in, in West Virginia, there has there was no evidence that I know of that was even collected. It's all anecdotal. I understand. And, you know, uh, one of my close friends here locally, we were talking about cryptids and he was like, I don't understand why people don't get evidence of it. And I said, man, let me tell you something. I said, we've both been around a place when people are shooting. Right. And he's like, yeah. I said, do you stop and uh, take a snap, a picture of the person shooting the gun, or do you run and get out of the way of the bullets? He's like, yeah, you're right. You get out of the way of the bullets. I said, now imagine a walking wolf or a flying being coming straight at you. You're not finna try and pull out your phone and take a picture. I'm sorry. It's just not going to happen. I don't think it's even humanly possible. It's going to take someone like you or Butch, who actually are investigators, who go in and seek it out to get the evidence. It's not going to be just an eyewitness that's got that kind of, uh, clarity of mind to do that is that's really not possible. I mean, it's just not. I don't see it. I know when I've had. Well, it, it's hard for a chain of custody too when a witness gets, you know, gets evidence like that. Um, especially in an urban setting, where you can pick up almost anything. You know what I'm saying? 
Yeah. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think it's kind of hard. You know, I, I've even gotten to the point where I was trying to give video evidence from, you know, in, in large cities now, there's there's video cameras everywhere. Right. And uh, the city wouldn't pro- help us provide, wouldn't provide us with anything. The uh, none of the businesses near these these incidents were willing to help us out. Uh, you know, every time I c- contacted a security company to a business or uh, a hotel or a condominium or that, they always said, well, you're, you're going to need we only only people we give this out to are the police. Are you going to have a, need a court order or something to that effect? Yeah. So. Well, they don't want to be caught up in the middle of that crap, man. I I, I know they don't. No. I wouldn't want to be caught up in in the middle of it. I'd be like, no, that's that's not going to happen. Well, I'm we running out of time. We're up to the. We got about ten minutes left. What I would like to do with these last ten minutes is I want you to give us the maybe two or three of the best actual eyewitness encounters. The ones that are kind of creepy and scary. One that very first one about it landing on a car was pretty spooky. Yeah, do you have for some of those that are actually uh, pretty terrifying? Well, yeah, the um, there was an incident in Bowling Brook, which is a which is a suburb of Chicago, and um, this woman who regularly took a walk at night through a playground in her neighborhood and she actually started walking up to this thing standing on the pavement now it wasn't flying or anything but she didn't know what it was and it was tall but she at first her mind she thought it was two people embracing but she heard some gurgling sounds and she didn't know what to make of it she walked a little bit closer and this thing turned to where it was square up to her, and she saw the broad shoulders on it. And she stated that it was a um, black mass. Uh, I asked her, did you see the head or wing? She said no, but she said the wings may have been wrapped around it, but it was making a gurgling sound. And uh, and I think it was sleeping, to be quite honest with you. I think this thing was standing and sleeping. Well, anyway, she was freaked out. She walked away from it to get around it. And as she was walking away, her legs got very weak and she became just weak all over and had to sit down at a park bench. And she gathered herself, keeping her eye out for this thing. But she eventually regained her, uh, regained herself and uh, got up and took off for home. When she got home, her son was there. She told him about it. He wanted to see what it was. They got in the car, and they drove over towards the playground, which was like a half a block away. And as they approached it, they he noticed this thing in the bushes. And it kind of made, made it like a, a leap out towards it. But, it, you know, it didn't actually jump out, but it stood up. And he he hit the gas and then got out of there. So they actually called me right after they got home. And I'm telling you, they were they were out of it. I mean, they were both of them were crying. They want to know what it was, you know, they they found my number on the internet and uh they called me right away. So I mean, that was a that was a pretty harrowing encounter. I mean, No, that's like something out of a freaking movie, bro. Like Yeah. Uh-uh. No. And so she actually felt so weak that she had to sit down in the park on the bench, probably less than 100 yards from where she saw this creature. Oh, she I was pretty close to it. Yeah. been crawling, yeah. bro. I would have crawled away from that thing. <laughs> that That's crazy, man. Well, the, the woman, the, the couple, the actual couple who had, um, and I, I'll get into that story a little deeper. They were They were walking in front of the condominium. And this thing flew in front of them and above them from the lake area and, and actually was flying over the trees up the condominium wall and stopped in midair and was like, and they said it looked like it was looking through a window. 
They got scared and started running towards the entrance. This thing uh, bent backwards and dove down into the trees. And as they turned the corner to head towards the uh, towards the uh, entrance to the condominium, this thing ascended slowly in front of them. They were like 15 foot away from it, and it just hovered in front of them with its wings spread out. Now, they, they stated that they noticed someone across the street must have took a flash with the camera because they saw the flash. And there was a guy that was in a delivery truck that freaked out too. They could hear him screaming. And uh, she actually collapsed after a bit. Her husband actually had to pick her up and carry her into the condominium after this thing ascended up and you know, away, descended up away from them. But it hovered in front of them for about 15 seconds. Man, I wouldn't be any good anymore after something like that. I probably couldn't. It, I couldn't go outside at night after that, because you know, as human beings, we we rarely look up, right? We, I'm I look up everywhere I go, but that's because of my background. But as human beings, we rarely look up because you never think that you'll see anything like that. But man, if something like that descended out of the sky in front of me, I would lose it, Lon. I'm telling you, I would lose it. Uh, Mm-mm. It, it was an interesting story because they called me, they found me on the internet and they called me the next day. They were supposed, they were visiting her mother who lived in the condo. They were from Washington, D.C. And uh, she was so scared, she was afraid to get on the plane because they were supposed to leave that day. They actually stayed in Chicago two extra days. And because uh, she wouldn't get on the plane. And what's interesting is. You know, I, I could tell by their accent uh, that they, the husband, because the husband didn't talk to me that much, but I could tell they were Eastern European. And it turns out, and I figured out he was, he's a professional athlete in Washington, D.C. So uh, I figured out who it was, but of course, I'm not going to say who it was. And uh, their story checked out really, really well. Holy crap. You know, I I can visually see this thing flipping over backwards and diving down towards them. I'm telling (laughs) you, man, I would like poop on myself if I saw that. I mean, because that's scary. That's a very, very scary visual right there. Uh, And to say that it seemed like it was looking for an open window is a whole nother element of it. Because you imagine going to the bathroom to take a leak. And um, you're like on the 10th floor of the condo and you're going to take a piss and then you look over out the window and this thing hovering outside with red eyes. It sounds like something off of uh, something that you'd have seen on the old school Ghostbusters. You know, with, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I have had reports in the past where people have um, reported that they've seen these uh, these flying beings with red eyes looking through windows a couple of times through bathroom windows. So uh, yeah, that's not that's not out of the possibility. I, that has actually been reported before. Another good question before we wrap this up: um, Were there more females that were having these encounters than males? Maybe you know he's looking for to snatch him up. Somebody he needs a little loving. <clears throat> I would say probably sixty percent female. I mean, there were a lot of couples, there were a lot of groups, but you know, the people who contacted me or the people that had um, that had singular sightings were mostly female. Yeah, yeah, that, I, that's something we might have to look into. All right, line buddy, we are out of time. Before we wrap this up, tell everybody where they can go buy the book. Um, and a little bit about the website, about the shows that cause you just launched a new show. Go ahead and promote the stuff mm-hmm. that you got going on, buddy. Well, the website is famsandmonsters.com. We have a free daily newsletter that you can subscribe to, and you can get that in your email. We've currently got about 30,000 daily subscribers. And um, the books can be found on Amazon. The book is titled Mothman Dynasty. Chicago's winged humanoids. If you go to um, go to Amazon and, and search my name, Lon Strickler, or search 
uh, Fams and Monsters or Mothman Dynasty, you'll find the book. I've got several other books on there as well. And, uh, yeah, we've got a radio show that we started about a month and a half ago. Uh, it's a commercial show. It's titled The Existence of Strange Things, and we're on RadioMemphis.com. And that goes live. Well, it's not live. It's a recorded show, but it's presented each Friday night at 11 o'clock. It's a three-hour show. Amazing. That's awesome, man. And, Lon, I personally want to thank you for your love and your support, my friend. Um, I really appreciate you. I appreciate you joining me tonight, but I also appreciate you as an individual and as a human being for your support, man. I mean, you've always been very supportive of me. So I appreciate you, and I love you, man. And you have a great evening and a good night, my friend. You take care. Talk soon. All right. Talk to you soon, buddy. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is Lon, my guy, Strickler. And that was some creepy stuff, especially that last one about it kind of hovering in front of the couple. I know if it was me and my old lady, she'd probably be like, yo, she'll look at me and be like, yo, bae, what's that? And I'd be like, that's the moth man. She'd be like, quit playing, bae. I'm like, that's the moth man. And then she would actually ignore Mothman. She would just turn around and walk off like he's not there. Just turn around and walk off because she, she's a straight OG when it comes to that kind of stuff. Ghost in the house, straight ignore him. Like, you don't exist. Get the hell out of here. <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed this interview. I think I'm getting sick because my nose is all stuffy. I'm starting to feel like I'm getting a cold, which every year around this time, I normally get a cold. So I'm going to medicate myself. I'm going to go wrap up in the covers and um and take me some NyQuil. I might go get me some Vicks Vapor Rub and get myself together, man. I don't need to get sick. It's too much to do, too much going on, too many things to take care of. Guys, uh Primal Fear will be re being released soon. There are a few people that need to record. Um Linda needs to record her portion of it and Lon actually needs to record his portion of it. So Primal Fear will be coming soon. Uh, I am just trying to make it the best album that I could possibly make it. My portions are done. I just need to get everyone else's portions added on to it, do a final listen, and bada bing, bada boom, we are off and running. Lon is posting the existence of strange things as his radio, um, his radio show. You guys should check him out. Actually, he said it airs on Friday, so that's tomorrow night. And I'm going to get out of here. I really love you guys and I appreciate you. This is your boy. Life's a coat of many colors. It is never black and white. Can't have one without the other. The dark without the light in the summer we were lovers with the flame our hearts would burn a flame the autumn would smother and leave this heart to 